Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for attending our monthly College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Alison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And through our Pilina Ao webinar series, we are aiming to bring the very best of research from throughout the College of Natural Sciences and some of our sister units to all of you. And today's presentation will feature Dr. Amy Moran, who is a professor from the School of Life Sciences in the College of Natural Sciences. Dr. Moran studies physiology and ecology of marine invertebrates. After completing her PhD at the University of Oregon, postdocs at the University of Washington and the University of Southern California, as well as several years on the faculty at Clemson University, she joined the faculty here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2013. Dr. Moran teaches in the marine biology major, and she's also a scuba diver and a strange animal enthusiast. The stranger, the better. She has served as president of the American Academy of Underwater Sciences. She's a subject editor for the journals Invertebrate Biology and the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. And she has led six Antarctic research expeditions. Her current research investigates how warming oceans will affect marine organisms in Hawaii, in Antarctica, and in marine environments more generally. And so now I'd like to turn over our time to Dr. Moran for her talk, Fantastic Beasts and Frozen Oceans, Why a Cold Antarctic Matters. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Allison. I'm gonna um, share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Allison, can you see, is it visible? It looks great. Great, okay, thanks. So um, thank you all for coming today. Thanks for sharing some of your Wednesday afternoon um, to hear this talk. And what I'm gonna talk about today is some work that uh, my research group has been doing in collaboration with um, a research group at the University of Montana over the last, oh, I'd say um, 15 years or so in the Antarctic. And um, the reason that I decided to talk about Antarctic research today rather than research that we do in other parts of the world is because I think this is a, a region of the world that people generally don't know very much about. And also there's a lot of really great uh, stories to tell about the animals that live there. And then I will wrap up at the end of the talk with um, just a little sort of review of why having a cold Antarctica matters to our modern day world and keeping it as close to the way it, as it is now as, as possible. So Antarctica is a, um, a really unusual place, and I hope this video works all right for everyone. So Antarctica is on the bottom of the world from most global perspectives, and it's a place where there's year-round cold, um, ice and snow, and massive changes in photo period. It's very cold. The average temperature on the coast is about 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and inland um, about minus 71 Fahrenheit. So as we fly across the continent here, you can see that um, there's an ice sheet that forms around the continent every winter but that the main continent of Antarctica is covered by an ice sheet that is up to a mile thick in some places. Um, uh, less than 2% of the land is ice free and 70% of the Earth's fresh water is tied up in um, this major part of the Earth's cryosphere or the cold, coldest parts of the Earth. So this is what the um, inland looks like in the Antarctic, the main part of the Antarctic continent. This is the Antarctic Plateau. And it's exceptionally cold, um, very dry, um, lots of UV stress in the summer. And you can just tell it's just not a great place to be an animal, right? In fact, there's very uh, little life there and no multicellular life. So for a, a marine biologist, the center of the continent is not particularly interesting. Even, I mean, it is interesting, but not from that perspective. Even when you go to the coast of the continent, um, it's a very hostile place for animal life. So this is one of our uh, field sites that we've worked at in the Antarctic. And this is actually a beach here, and this is the ocean. Um, and just for scale, those little black dots in there are the field camps. So the scale of this continent is just enormous. But you can see that even in the middle of the summer, when the climate is the most mild, you can't see any animals or plants on, on the land. And there are a few microscopic things, extremely tolerant, simple organisms, but it's really just not, not a good place to be a complex organism. The largest terrestrial animal in the Antarctic, or the largest fully terrestrial animal is this one, um, uh, the Antarctic midge. 
And it, in fact, is only found in the um, warmest parts of the Antarctic from the Antarctic Peninsula, which is sort of the tropics of the Antarctic. So for terrestrial biological perspective, there's not a lot of diversity. Now, for a marine biologist, the marine, the situation in the ocean is quite a bit different. And um, my group and I have worked at uh, this location, which is McMurdo Station, Antarctica. It's the largest station and the largest human establishment on the Antarctic continent. And it is right on the coast of the Southern Ocean, which is this big frozen region here. And the location of McMurdo Station is um, at the northern edge of the Ross Ice Shelf, so all directions are north on this map um, in the center, but it's the, the southernmost part of the ocean in the whole world where there's ever open water. So this is the coldest accessible ocean that anyone can really work in that's not under permanent ice shelves. This is the um, uh, uh, Antarctic Hawaii team that I've worked with um, at McMurray Station, and um, three of my graduate students have been on trips down there with me not all at the same time. So Caitlin here is photoshopped in, which is why she looks a little strange. But Caitlin, Shishido, Graham Lobert, and Aaron Cho have all come with me as graduate students um, for multiple trips to the Antarctic. And then we've worked uh, with a lot of other people from other organizations as well on these projects. So I'd like to thank all of these people um, just now for, for all of their help with this. Now, um, this is uh, a helicopter view of McMurdo Sound, which is the Southern Ocean right around McMurdo Station in the summer. And as you can see, most of the year, most years, this is completely frozen over and the water is under, um, I'd say like three to nine feet of ice in most places. And that ice may break out seasonally or it may not, but ice really dominates the marine environment in this part of the world. Under that ice um, is a really interesting environment, which is unique in the ocean from a number of different perspectives. So there's ice everywhere because the air temperature is much colder than the water. So the water is constantly freezing. That means that the water is constantly at that equilibrium between ice and water, which is minus about minus two degrees for seawater. Um, there's ice everywhere. There's ice forming in the water. There's ice on the bottom. There's ice above you. And another unusual thing about this environment is that there are very high levels of oxygen relative to other parts of the ocean. So these factors pose a lot of challenges for the marine organisms that live there, um, but also some opportunities to evolve in ways that no other organisms have, which makes this a really fascinating place to work. When we think about um, Antarctic organisms, I think this is what we sort of tend to think about the most, um, <laughs> penguins, and these are really the the um, uh, sort of typical Antarctic animal. And penguins and seals and whales, other things that we think about as being Antarctic, um, are endotherms. And that means that for an Antarctic endotherm, its main job is to stay warm, right? And to get enough food to stay warm and to keep its babies warm. And so their biology is largely explained by adaptations to cold, to maintaining heat, and to getting enough energy to keep heat. So that's really fascinating, but that's not what we work on. Um, what I work on is um, ectotherms, invertebrates and fishes. I work on invertebrates, but everything in the ocean basically um, is an ectotherm. And these are organisms whose temperature matches their environment. What that means is that these lush communities of organisms that live under the Antarctic ice um, have to have metabolisms and physiology that can function basically at freezing point. And that's the coldest temperature that complex organisms live at. And so there are a lot of really interesting things that organisms do to be able to function in these environments. Now, diving there is also a really extraordinary experience uh, for a number of reasons. So first of all, of course, there's an ice ceiling, which takes a little bit of getting used to. The visibility is usually really good because of the low biological activity in the water. Um, and then there's all this just spectacular marine life to look at. And the, um, the scenes there are incredible. The organisms are really interesting and strange. And I'm just going to show you a few of these. Um, some of the animals there are very similar to what you might expect to see here in Hawaii, like these, um, the, the sea urchins. Um, these are very pretty similar, actually, in appearance to our Aina here in Hawaii, the short-spined sea urchins. 
Um, if it weren't for the fact that it was sitting on a block of ice and there's ice overhead, you might think this was just an urchin anywhere. Other organisms um, are familiar as well, such as the starfish here, but some of them are closely related to animals that you normally only see in the deep sea. And an example are these soft corals here and some of these really strange sponges. Marine sponges are really abundant in the Antarctic. Um, and this is a really um, famous example of the giant glass sponge that lives fairly close to shore within diveable depths in the Antarctic. And there are lots of other sponges uh, that you can see in these pictures, these yellow things and these little Dr. Susie spiky things. So a lot of really interesting organisms that normally are found only in the deep sea have managed to move up into shallow water depths in the Antarctic. Other strange things as well, this is a pteropod or a, a, a pelagic snail that is an important predator in the water column in Antarctic systems, oops, sorry. This is um, uh, a sea lily, and I'm just showing this to you because this is something that you would normally never see except in the deep sea, but we get the opportunity to see them live in the Antarctic, which is pretty amazing. And then the most amazing of all to me, and perhaps my favorite, are the sea spiders. And um, these are organisms that are found throughout the world, but are usually really small and cryptic. The ones that are in the Antarctic are often very large, brightly colored, and really conspicuous. So this is one of the groups that we've worked on, and I'm going to talk more about their biology in a little bit. So all of the organisms, all of the exotherms that are living under Antarctic ice, like these here, sea anemones, starfish, sponges, etc., all of these have been evolving at millions of years for millions of years um, under these extreme cold conditions and high oxygen. These conditions have persisted in the Antarctic for a really long time. And most of the organisms found in the Antarctic are only found in the Antarctic. They've been there for a long time, so they've had a, a, a big opportunity to adapt to these interesting conditions. And although I have to preface this by saying that we actually know very little about most Antarctic organisms, there are a number of paradigms about Antarctic um, biology for ectotherms that are out there in the literature. Um, and some of these are, let's see, so first of all, at very cold temperatures, all chemical reactions, including the ones that make up metabolism, are slowed down. And so Antarctic ectotherms have very slow metabolism and their whole pace of life is really slow. They don't move fast, they don't eat fast, they just sort of don't do much compared to warmer water animals. They also show very slow development and growth, which is related to the slow, the cold driven slow metabolism. And they tend to have very long lifespans and long generation times. This makes them vulnerable to climate change because they cannot change rapidly in response to climate change. And also kind of putting these two together, because these animals have been in these environments for a long time and the environments require them to adapt in really particular ways, they're cold temperature specialists, meaning that they can really only function at these extreme cold temperatures, and if they warm up, they're going to be really vulnerable. And so one of the <clears throat> sort of big ideas in Antarctic biology is that these ectotherms, these cold-blooded Antarctic marine species, are extremely temperature sensitive and may be one of the first groups to suffer um, as <clears throat> temperatures start to warm up. So one of the things that my research group has been doing is looking at these questions outside of the few species that have been looked at in great detail to try to figure out how broadly these principles apply and how vulnerable, in fact, these organisms may be to warming temperatures. Now, this is a picture of McMurdo Station that I put in here um, just to remind me to tell you that we don't do all of our work underwater. That wouldn't work. Um, McMurdo Station is a really great science facility with many scientists there in every research season. And this is the large science building that we would all be working in, doing our lab work with microscopes, computers, et cetera, in. Um, but I also realized that the diving there is um, a little bit um, different from diving other places. So I'm going to show you a short video, which I hope comes through, about how this all works. And this is a video we put together um, a few years ago as sort of a, uh, just a demonstration of that. So the United States Antarctic program has a drill with a 40 inch bit that they will drag out on the ice to wherever you want the hole. 
And that drill takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes to drill its way through the ice. And hopefully you can see this without too much jerkiness, but at some point it punches through the ice um, to the water underneath. They then drag a little fish hut, as they're called, underneath it. And then we have a nice hole in the ice with a hole in the bottom of the hut. And then the hut is heated, hopefully, so that you can just suit up on the side and jump in through the hole in the ice. And that is, in fact, quite a cold shock when you jump in. But once you come through the bottom of the ice, um, you're just in this spectacular world of strange animals and incredible visibility. We focused on the invertebrates and the ice. You can see some of the ice that just forms on everything. But there are also vertebrates there as well. I and mean, we get visited by seals pretty regularly. So um, one thing I get a lot of questions about is seals when we're diving. Um, and it is true that the seals need breathing holes and they like the dive holes. So this is, <laughs> this is an issue sometimes when you're getting ready to get all suited up to jump in and a seal decides to come up and hang out in the hole. And they're actually um, quite, quite friendly seals in a lot of ways. Um, this isn't really a problem. We just wait for them to go away and try not to disturb them. It can occasionally be a problem, and that's when at the end of the dive, you come back to the hole and the seal is in it. And that can be a little bit more of an issue. So um, just throwing that in there to show you what that looks like. It's kind of a fun experience. So I'm going to return to these larger questions and talk a bit about some of the research that we've done over the years. And just to give you a little taste of the kinds of projects that we've worked on in the Antarctic, testing some of these ideas. So first of all, um, like I said, we don't know these kinds of things for most organisms in the Antarctic. There just hasn't been a lot of work done on them. And one of the groups that we've worked on are the sea spiders. And this is, a, a, again, a pretty poorly known group. And we've learned a lot about them doing these projects. One of the things that we've known for a long time is that these sea spiders brood their embryos. So this little pinky patch here is a bunch of embryos at different stages of development that the animal is going to carry around with it until they drop off. And we've measured the metabolic rate of those embryos to compare them to the metabolic rates of embryos elsewhere in the world and larvae, and also to see what their metabolic rates are, um, how they're affected by temperature. So this is one of those little balls of embryos, and we can separate those out. This is what three different stages of development of a sea spider look like, if you've ever wondered about that. As they get older, they turn from basically eggs into little juvenile sea spiders. And this graph shows um, the metabolic rate of these three different embryonic stages in equivalence of oxygen consumed per hour. And what this graph shows is like not super important to understand, but temperature has a big effect. So these are warm temperature measurements, and these are cold temperature measurements. Um, but what to a physiologist, if you were used to looking at these numbers, you would think, oh my gosh, that's an incredibly slow metabolic rate. And I realized that this, these units, picomoles of oxygen per microgram per hour are not immediately intuitive. So I put together as a slightly silly example. But if you take something that, that's sort of more familiar to us, like a Skittle. Skittle has about four calories in it. Um, and four calories, if we consume four calories, we would use that as the metabolic substrate for oxygen. And that would last us about five minutes, I guess, maybe 10 minutes at our own metabolic rates of energy utilization. If a sea spider embryo, one of the sea spider embryos ate a Skittle, it would be able to live on it for about 50,000 years. That's how slow their metabolism is. And that's a very, um, very low rate of energy utilization. Um, another paradigm is slow development and growth. And we've had some really excellent opportunities to look at this over the years because we've made repeated trips to the Antarctic. And one of the things that we've done is to take embryos and larvae and newly laid embryos of different types of invertebrates, like a nudibranch, a snail, and this head shield slug here. We've gotten newly laid embryos. This is an egg mass of this nudibranch. We put them out in the field um, at natural conditions, natural temperatures, and just monitor them over time to see how long it takes them to hatch out as juveniles. For these three different species, that took a year. Um, for other species, it takes longer. So sea spiders take between two and three or maybe more years, at least for the ones that we looked at, which is a remarkably long amount of time to go from a fertilized egg to a juvenile of a species. 
And the king of sort of long development in the Antarctic is this species, Antarctodomus chilei. This species, um, a long time ago, we found an egg mass and we actually didn't know what it was. This isn't known for a lot of Antarctic species. So we use barcoding to identify what species it belonged to. And then we returned to this egg mass in the field year after year. And we found that they were hatching after eight years in the field. So this is actually the longest known developmental period of any animal. And it's attributable, I think, to the extreme cold temperatures that are in the environment that we, that we were working. Another example, this is not from our work, but these big glass sponges that I showed you a couple of minutes ago are known as Methuselah sponges in the popular literature. And that's because a paper came out a few years ago that measured the growth rate of these over time and estimated that some of the really large barrel glass sponges are up to 15,000 years old, making them perhaps the oldest animals that we know of. Um, more recent research has suggested that under the right conditions, they can grow a lot faster than that, but still, clearly these big animals in the Antarctic are really, really old. So examples of ice and cold specialists. So these are examples of organisms that are so highly specialized to cold temperatures and ice formation that they will be, the trade-offs that they've made in order to be able to do that may make them unable to live at warmer temperatures. And the best known examples of this, and in fact of Antarctic physiology generally, come from this group of fish. These are the notothenioid fishes. They're mostly endemic to the Southern Ocean. There are a few other cold species, not in the Southern Ocean. In the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, they make up about 90% of the fish biomass, so they're almost all of the fish. And the best known ones, most of them are these kind of little scopin looking things, but the best known ones are um, the um, Antarctic and Patagonian toothfish, which are the Chilean sea bass, so there's a fishery for the really big ones. But the small ones um, in the high Antarctic live in and around ice, which is what you can see here. And that's a question is sort of how that works, because if ice is forming in the water outside the animal, it would be forming in the fluids inside the animal, which would, is very bad for organisms. And so we know from years of study by fish groups that work on these organisms that um, notothenioid fishes have antifreeze proteins in their blood to lower the freezing temperature of their blood. Um, another interesting adaptation is that most organisms have uh, something that's called a heat shock response, which is a cellular and molecular defense that organisms mount when there's heat stress to protect protein structure. But the notothenioid fishes, some of them have lost this ability. Um, they also have other adaptations on the cellular and physiological level to enable their metabolisms to function at really cold temperatures. And another really interesting thing that showed up in the fishes is that um, some of them, some of the notothenioid fishes, have actually lost hemoglobin in their blood. And they're the only vertebrates that don't have hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying protein, in their blood. So if you compare the blood of an Antarctic ice fish, um, it's clear to a relative with hemoglobin, it's red. And the, the idea is that these species have lost hemoglobin um, because there's so much oxygen in the water that they simply don't need it. Um, but you can imagine that as temperatures rise, species that have lost oxygen carrying proteins and that have lost their heat shock response are not gonna be able to compete with species from warmer climates that still have them. So another example of cold specialist specialization and the one that, um, that I've worked on is something called polar gigantism. And that's just what it sounds like. This is a pattern that has been um, described for since the sort of mid 19th century, but never really fully explained, still has not been fully explained. And this is a pattern whereby organisms, invertebrates that are um, small in temperate and tropical regions, um, like this pill bug here, which you could probably find, um, I just go outside my office and turn over a log, there will be these little pill bugs under it. In the Antarctic, these groups have representatives that are much, much bigger. So this is the Antarctic equivalent of a pill bug. This is a marine isopod that gets to be several inches long. And this pattern of, of large representatives of groups in the Antarctic and in the Ar Antar Arctic, sorry, has shown up in multiple taxonomic groups. Um, it's found in um, uh, pelagic animals like tinophores and jellyfish. It's found in sponges, 
You've been found in single-celled organisms where you can get single cells that are a millimeter or more across in some protistian organisms. And of course, it's found in the sea spiders, which is the group that we've worked on. And whenever there's a pattern like this in nature where there's something um, obvious that shows up in group after group, that live in a, in a similar environment. Um, biologists get really excited about that because that suggests that there's something going on. There's something that's really fundamental principle that's underlying that. And maybe we can try to understand some of the laws, some of the rules of life, some of the things that govern things like body size in a, in a larger perspective. And yeah, so biologists don't have a lot of laws. Um, that's mostly physics, physicists um, and chemists. We kind of Evolution has done so many different things that we just get excited when there's really strong patterns like this. So there've been a lot of things suggested uh, as, as underlying factors driving polar gigantism. But the one that's kind of dominated over the last 20 or 30 years is something called the oxygen temperature. The up arrow there. So there's a, a number of layers to this hypothesis and I'm just gonna kind of Okay, can you guys hear me? I just got a message I was muted. Can people still hear me? Interesting question. Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so the oxygen temperature hypothesis is a number of different layers, <clears throat> excuse me. One of these layers is the fact that one of the biggest jobs that every organism has to do is to get oxygen from the external environment into their tissues and into their mitochondria, which is where we use it. <clears throat> and the bigger an organism is, and the higher its metabolism, the bigger a job that is. And this pattern is really obvious in life through the evolution and the sort of incredible um, diversity of different ways that organisms evolve get oxygen and move it into their mitochondria. And these are things like gills and lungs and circulatory systems and red blood cells and tracheal systems and insects. Um, in fact, a lot of organismal design can be explained by this particular need. So the bigger an organism is, um, the bigger job that is, that's one of the layers here. Another layer is that at really cold temperatures for exotherms, metabolism is forced to be slow because chemical reactions are slow. And so the organismal oxygen demand of exotherms at cold temperatures is lower. They just don't need as much oxygen, um, largely because they can't use it because their metabolisms can't run that fast. So that's one part of it. In the Antarctic and in polar regions generally, the waters are very cold. And in the Antarctic, they're very highly oxygenated. And what that sets up is a situation where Antarctic ectotherms are in, um, uh, uh, in a sort of situation of a high ratio of oxygen supply to demand. They don't need very much oxygen and there's lots of it around. And the oxygen temperature hypothesis suggests that polar gigantism may have evolved because it's allowed to in the Antarctic, basically. Another way to think of this is that if there's a ceiling on the maximum body size that an organism can reach, which is set by the levels of oxygen available in the environment and the metabolic demand of that organism, in the Antarctic, that ceiling is higher, so animals can evolve to larger sizes. This is a really compelling hypothesis, and I think there is an awful lot to it, um, and it's really interesting. Um, and one of the, the implications of it, I think, is that, um, as Tom pointed out many times, that if this is in fact what's going on, then polar giants are going to be perhaps the canaries in the coal mine of global warming in the Antarctic. So they're gonna be the first ones that start experiencing constraints on performance as waters warm up. So that's the kind of basic hypothesis that we were interested in testing. And we tested this using sea spiders. And before I, I get into, um, the way we did it and the results, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sea spiders. So sea spiders are in the phylum Arthropoda, which is the uh, largest and um, uh, most diverse of all the phyla. So actually probably most organisms on Earth are arthropods, things like crabs, and insects in this group. Within the arthropods, they're in the subphylum Chilicerata, which when I teach the invertebrate biology course at UGH, I tell the students this is the creepy crawly phylum because it has things in it like spiders and scorpions and ticks and mites, and also the sea spiders. 
And when I'm talking about sea spiders, one of the questions I get a lot is, are they really spiders that just live in the ocean? And so the answer is no. Um, on, a, on a taxonomic perspective, just using Linnaean taxonomy, a sea spider is about as closely related to a spider as a seahorse is to a horse. And so we sort of intuitively know that these two organisms just look like each other, but aren't that closely related. And the same is true of sea spiders and land spiders. So they're in the class Pycnogonida. That's the group name for sea spiders. There's about 2,000 species of them worldwide. And um, they're found in all parts of the ocean. In most parts of the world, they're really small. But in the Antarctic, they are um, highly diverse and they're really abundant. And they make up a big and very conspicuous part of the benthic fauna. So they're just sea spiders kind of walking all over the place when you go diving. You can dive here for years and never see a sea spider in the Antarctic. You can really not get in the water without seeing them. So it's a, it's a very sea spider rich uh, place. And just to give you an idea, so there's, a, there's a wide size range of sea spiders in the Antarctic, but there are also a lot of giant species. So this, this is a um, Hawaiian species from the Bishop Museum collection. I don't know if you can see it, but this is a picture of it right here. And this little orange thing here is the Hawaiian sea spider. And um, in the Antarctic, they say they reach the size of dinner plates. And to show that, one of my grad students, Caitlin, took a picture of one on a dinner plate. This is a giant Antarctic sea spider. And you can see that there's just a huge size difference between the typical temperate and tropical sea spider and the really big Antarctic. Another interesting thing about sea spiders is that I showed you a bunch of complex ways that organisms can get oxygen, um, but sea spiders don't do that. They are what's called skin breathers. They don't have gills or lungs. They don't have a really strong circulatory system. Um, and oxygen gets into them just by diffusing across the cuticles of their legs. Interesting and, and good system for modeling um, questions about the oxygen temperature. So the basic question we asked, and this, this seemed like a really simple experiment, at least we thought it was, um, was does warm temperature affect large sea spiders more than small ones? As you warm up the water, are the larger ones gonna show a loss of function faster than the smaller ones? So the first problem we had to solve was how to test uh, function and endurance in sea spiders. We can't exactly run them on a treadmill. So what we did instead, and this, these are, um, an example from Caitlin Shishido's thesis. And in this case, we took 80 individuals of a wide range of sizes from small to big. And we put them in a tank at four different temperatures. So each spider was measured at these four different temperatures from their ambient temperature to plus nine centigrade. And then we um, basically flipped them upside down. And it's this is an established method in invertebrate biology. Even if you can't get an invertebrate to do anything else, they hate being upside down and will turn themselves upright. So our index for performance was picnic flips per hour. What we did was to put a sea spider in a tank at a particular temperature. So here's a video to hopefully see a big spider, flip it over with a pair of forceps, and then um, wait for it to right itself. And as you can see, they really hate being upside down. They go through this very elaborate and high energy attempt to right themselves. Um, if there's nothing to grab onto, it's like a weird upside down ballet dance, watching them try to do it. And it takes a little while, this animal will eventually right itself successfully. And then once the animal has gotten itself back in its preferred orientation, in these tests, the forceps come in again, flip it over, and we count how many times they can do that in an hour. So let me show you, first of all, what a temperature size interaction would look like in these experiments if, if we had found one. So that's a little hint that we didn't find one. In these experiments, sort of what we are doing, if there's a graph here and you have performance in, in picnic flips per hour going up on the y-axis and body mass going up on the x-axis, which is the biggest animals are over here and the smallest ones are over here. If we ran the picnic flip tests for an hour, we would expect, I guess, at minus 1.8 that they would all do about the same, regardless of size. If we warm them up to four degrees, we might expect to see the big ones starting to be a little bit slower because they're becoming oxygen limited by those warmer temperatures. And then as we progressively increase the temperature, that difference would just get bigger and bigger. 
And this would demonstrate that the large animals are actually hitting an oxygen deficit sooner as temperatures increase. So that's not what we found. This is a really simple prediction. Um, we, we were happy to be able to test for it, but it is just not what we found. Now, these are the actual data um, from Caitlin Shishido's thesis. And what this shows is, again, same thing, the number of pycnoflips per hour on the y-axis and body mass on the x-axis. But the performance of each spider at minus 1.8 showed in blue. And you can see they all did best at minus 1.8. When we warmed them up, there was a big slowdown in their ability to right themselves at four degrees, another big slowdown at seven degrees, and then at nine degrees, they were actually very, had a very difficult time writing themselves at all. So temperature affected performance strongly, size had a small effect, but there wasn't any interaction between the two, meaning that the big ones and the small ones were affected equally. So does this mean that the temperature oxygen hypothesis is wrong? And I think the answer to that is no. I mean, the, the, all the basic premises of that hypothesis are grounded in what we know to be true. So I think what that means is that the larger animals actually have a much greater capacity to compensate for increased oxygen demand than we thought they did. So that becomes the next question is how do these larger animals compensate? And I'm gonna give you three quick examples of that. First of all, um, sea spiders are, are skin breathers, meaning that gas exchange occurs across the cuticle. So this is a cross section through a cuticle of the sea spider. And they do it either just through the cuticle if they're really small or through pores in the cuticle if they're really large. And one of the graduate students at the University of Montana on this project did a really nice modeling study showing that uh, for a piece of sea spider cuticle, um, actually all of the diffusive oxygen exchange happens through those pores. So the pores are basically where that's happening. And we were also able to show that as the animals get larger, the number and size of pores increases. So a small animal might just have a few pores in its cuticle, small ones. As you get bigger, you see a larger number of pores. And then the really largest animals, the giants, have cuticles that kind of look like Swiss cheese. They're just full of these pores. What that allows the animals to do is increase their oxygen uh, uptake as they get larger. And this is just some data from Caitlin Shishida's thesis showing the same thing happening within species. So both between and within species, as animals grow, their cuticles get more porous and their ability to get oxygen from the environment increases as well. Now, another interesting little weird thing about sea spider biology is that they have wimpy little hearts. So the hearts here, and you really can barely see it, but their guts, their, their digestive glands actually run all the way out through their legs. And that's so they can digest food, even though they just have this tiny little body. It's been known for a long time that there are peristaltic contractions that run along the gut and mix the food in the gut. And this video shows a little bit about that. And I, I hope you can see the pulsing movements in the legs. Those are the peristaltic contractions of the gut extensions that go out into the legs. And uh, my longtime collaborator, Art Woods, did a bunch of measurements and modeling with Antarctic sea spider legs. And this is an Antarctic sea spider leg here, showing the peristaltic contractions of the gut that runs through the legs. And what he was able to show was that um, uh, these contractions not only stir the food in the gut, they also stir the blood in the circulatory system, which is outside the gut in the leg. And their net effect is to transport oxygen from the legs into the body of the animal. Um, so this is the first example that, that we know of where the gut of an animal is actually used to circulate oxygen through the body. The other thing that was neat was that as you warm these animals up, their gut beat increases, sort of like your heartbeat would increase if you needed more oxygen. Now, one last weird thing I'm going to show you about sea spiders. Um, most, so they have this pair of legs, a pair of appendages here, which in most sea spiders are used to carry the embryos. Um, but the very largest sea spiders don't use them for that. They don't carry their embryos on the overturned legs, as they're called. Instead, what they use them for is cleaning themselves. So this is a sea spider, a big one in the field, and you can see it's got the end of its leg kind of wrapped around its other leg there. And what they do is they slowly wipe those little brushes down the legs and it cleans off any little animals that might have landed on their, um, on their legs, like barnacles that might want to grow, cleans off bacteria, et cetera. 
And presumably the reason they do this is because they need to use those legs as gas exchange for oxygen uptake. And if they were fouled with other organisms, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and this is just a neat little story. So in the field, you basically just see them standing there. They're moving so slowly that you can't see what they're doing. And Graham Lober, who's one of my grad students, did a time lapse of a sea spider that was uh, in one of our tanks at McMurrow Station. And you can see that this is a really an elaborate cleaning procedure. And they're constantly grooming to keep their cuticles clean. And this one, I just sort of like watching this because I feel like you can tell that it's got some like Gunji stuff on the on the tip of its leg there, and it's going to work its leg through that little cleaning loop until it gets it, toss it aside, and then just keep cleaning themselves. So they're like cats; they're sort of constantly self grooming. And this is something that we've only seen in the big ones, not in the small ones. So all of these behavioral, physical, and physiological changes allow the large animals to compensate for increased oxygen demand in really complex ways. Now I want to point out one thing about kind of science communication. Um, this paper in 2019 got a lot of publicity when it came out, which was really great. You know, I'd love to see sea spiders and Antarctica um, get publicity. But we were a little disturbed because some of the stories reported that what this study meant was that giant sea spiders may survive well in warming oceans, and this is how they're going to do it. And I just want to I want to point out that you know, the reason this disturbed us because that's not actually what we said. And that's not what our data showed. Um, this is the part of our paper where we actually address this issue. And it's maybe too sciencey. We just basically said it's really complicated to predict winners or losers because we don't understand the organisms well enough to know what they're doing. But from an actual perspective of vulnerability to climate change, what the data actually show are that regardless of body size, warming has a huge impact on the ability of these animals to function. Um, and so I think that's really the big concern that, yes, we did find that the Antarctic animals are highly vulnerable to warmer temperatures. It's just that they all are, not just the big ones. So I'm going to end with just a, a few um, uh, comments about why a cold Antarctica matters. And I think part of it is just that this is the last great um, unexplored, little known and pristine place on Earth. The Antarctic is probably the most pristine and least disturbed environment on Earth. Um, and so not only are there a lot of really beautiful and unique organisms that have evolved there, but it also sort of calls to the human spirit as um, uh, places where you can step where no one has ever walked really easily and see things that no one has ever seen. And that is really exciting and a really profound experience. But the Antarctic ecosystem is under a lot of different threats, which are, I'm just going to highlight a few of these in the next few slides. But one of these is warming. And as the Antarctic slowly warms up, that's going to have a lot of repercussions that are going to be felt everywhere. One of these is sea level rise. So this is from the latest IPPC synthesis report. Um, and what this graph shows is that there are three main contributors to uh, projected sea level rise, the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet, and glacier mass loss. And the Antarctic ice sheet is a really big component of that. Of that. So about three, about a third of projected sea level rise is due to loss of that Antarctic ice sheet, projected loss of that Antarctic ice sheet. Um, so that is a, a, obviously a lot of concern to everyone. Another interesting thing is that as those ice sheets are lost and as freshwater runoff increases into the waters around um, Antarctica, it's going to have projected to have big effects on these benthic communities that I've been talking about. Um, and this is what sums that up here. Warming is going to increase iceberg scour, freshwater runoff, sedimentation, and a lot of other things. And those are going to have big impacts on these highly specialized benthic communities. And there are many reasons to be concerned about that, but one of them is that Antarctic, sorry, marine invertebrates and particularly sponges are a very rich source of bioactive compounds that have been used to develop human medicines. And this is really sort of just started in the Antarctic. And this is an interesting paper that came out recently suggesting that um, the chemical ecology of the Antarctic is unique and may, this may actually be a particularly great place for bioprospecting for human medicines. And this is one example that um, I'm really fond of because these sponges are pretty abundant at our dive sites um, and they really look like something that should be orbiting 
uh, another planet rather than under this, the sea ice. But sponges in this genus and this species are really rich sources of these secondary metabolites. And at least one of them is being explored as a promising treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So if we lose these communities and the species before we've even had a chance to see what they have to offer us, we may lose a lot of potential um, for um, human health. Now, another important aspect of the Antarctic has to do with this formation of the ice sheet around it every year. Um, so the sea ice freezes in the winter because the air is so cold. And the formation and melting of that sea ice causes uh, is an important factor in global thermohaline circulation. And this is a, a really cool animation where they're peeling back the upper levels of the ocean. So these are the warmer and less dense parts of the ocean. And what you can see is that the um, on the Antarctic uh, continental shelf, really dense and very cold water masses form due to that sea ice formation. And these are very heavy, so they sort of run down the continental shelf of the Antarctic and then pool and spread out over the bottom of the ocean. And as a result, they oxygenate and uh, a lot of the ocean, a lot of the bottom of the ocean, and they transport heat around the planet as well. So as part of this process, um, the, the ocean overall has taken up about 90% of the excess heat that we put into the biosphere um, through greenhouse gases. And the Southern Ocean has been responsible for almost all of that uptake. So it is a really important buffer for um, climate change. Oops, sorry. And then one more thing that I'm gonna bring up um, because this is sort of near and dear to all of our hearts here in Hawaii and that's tourism. Antarctic tourism has been increasing tremendously since it first started uh, sort of in the 1990s. And we're just now beginning to understand the effects that tourism has on the Antarctic ecosystem. And of course, the more tourists there are, the more impacts there are. And so that is of increasing concern. And some of the things that we know have already happened are that there have been um, uh, bacteria disease bacteria transmitted from humans to penguins, probably through interactions like this. So um, pathogenic human bacteria have showed up in penguin feces, no doubt through this kind of transfer. And we just don't know what the impacts of those kinds of things are gonna be like. And then there's just the increasing impacts from large numbers of people, increasingly large numbers of people in the tanks. So disturbance to animals, introduction of invasive species, all sorts of physical damage to the environment, and then the um, inevitable large and small oil spills from all the boat traffic bringing tourists to the Antarctic. And then of course the large carbon footprint of all that travel itself. So I don't know, I don't know what to do about that, um, but fortunately there are a lot of people working on it and thinking about it. Um, the Antarctic Treaty System is actually what oversees activities in the Antarctic. And this is a, a, a group of 54 signatory nations that's advised by the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and also interfaces with things like the IPCC and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then there's another group called the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, which are attempting to maintain tourism at some sort of functional level that people want while minimizing, by minimizing its impacts. So I think there are a lot of reasons for optimism, but there are also a lot of reasons for concern I just want to end with a quote from Barack Obama, um, that we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and to see them, and the last generation who can do something about it. And I think that the Antarctic is a, a really, um, going to be a really interesting place over the next several decades, because it is still relatively pristine right now, but I think we're going to see some very profound changes to the way things are today and that the organisms that come there. So I just wanna uh, end by thanking the funding organizations and the university and um, uh, universities and federal agencies that have supported this. To all the people who very kindly have told me that I can use their photos whenever they want, whenever I want. Um, if it weren't for these photos, these talks would not be very interesting. And I'd like to thank you for listening and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really a wonderful talk. It's so interesting to see what goes on under the sea ice down in the Antarctic. It's really a fascinating place. We're gonna open up our question period now. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free to just unmute, unmute your microphone or you can enter something in the chat box and we will find it there.
Hey, we have a question that just arrived in the chat from Virginia Hinshaw. Are there predators that consume sea spiders? How do you make sure you can find the hole in the ice at the end of a dive? Oh, those are both great questions. Um, to the first one, uh, we don't know what eats the sea spiders. We've um, actually, <laughs> in our, some of our first early experiments there, we tried to feed them to lots of different things and everything just spit them out. So we think they may be chemically descended or just not appealing for some reason. Um, the second question, how you find the hole on the way back, that's a great question. That the visibility is incredibly good. So pretty much you just never want to be where you can't see the hole to find your way back to it. But we also mark it with flags and strobes. So that makes it um, more confident that we can easily find our way back to it. I Oh, so we can hear hey. somebody talking, but it's very faint. All right, well, uh, go ahead, Rob. I see your hand is up. I read about these lakes that are under the ice on the actual continent. I just wonder if there's been any research on life in those lakes. There has been quite a bit. It's, it's not really my area, but I know that they've drilled down into some of them to try to sample the water and see what kinds of communities are there. And that's been really controversial um, because as soon as you basically get a drill into the lake, you've contaminated it with drilling fuel and sort of whatever else is um, in your in your in your hole, basically. <laughs> and so I think there's been a lot of concern about how to sample those communities without if they're there without um, damaging them. And other than that, yeah, I don't know much about it. Amy, are the food webs different in Antarctica than what you would find in say tropical marine system? Um, I was just looking at the photos that you had early on. It looks very barren compared to what I would see on a tropical coral reef. You mean the, the marine food webs? Yeah, I think there's some um, there's some pretty important differences. So at least where we were working, it's dark half the year and it's light half the year. So the the food the food dynamics are driven by a huge pulse of productivity that happens once a year, and everything gets to eat, and then it doesn't eat, you know, for the rest of the year, and it's in the dark. So that's driven a lot of interesting um, sort of physiological. It, it's it's gonna be hard for organisms to make it all winter if it's not cold, for one thing, because their metabolic demand will be a lot higher. So that's kind of an interesting thing. The other um, the other thing that's really different about the Antarctic food web is that it's really short. So the krill are kind of the dominant organism that everything eats. And so even the very topmost predators like the leopard seals are consuming krill. And that means that there can be a pretty high biomass of large predators relative to other places. So yeah, there's some there's some fundamental differences, um, but a lot of the benthic and vertebrate food web just haven't been very well studied. Great, right, thank you, Rob. Your hand is up. Yeah, can you tell me why the oxygen content is so high in the water? Um, yeah. So of course, part of it is that gases are more soluble at, in cold water than they are in warm water, um, but that's not really what makes that. Uh, high ratio of oxygen supply to demand because even though there's a lot of oxygen in the seawater, its diffusion rate is relatively slow because it's so cold. So what really drives that ratio of high oxygen supply to demand is that the metabolic demand is really low, if that makes sense. Um, the other reason that the Antarctic waters are pretty highly oxygenated, I believe, is just because there's not very much metabolic drawdown of oxygen in the water. So I think that drives that as well. A related question from Daryl in the chat. What is the oxygen concentration in the water there? Um, so the oxygen saturation, oh, I, I have a graph I could show you. It ranges from about 82% um, saturation of air saturation in the winter when the sea ice is sort of covering everything up and there's no exchange and there's no photosynthesis to like 120%, so super saturated when the phytoplankton bloom rolls in. So there's a big annual variation in oxygen availability, but it's always pretty highly oxygenated. 
Very good. Uh, so there's a comment. Um, Maria was there in 1967 and again in 2019. Oh. Noticed, I guess, changes in the, the penguin communities over that time span. Oh, that's really, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I know the penguins have been moving around a lot. A lot of the species of penguins are really affected by sea ice, and the sea ice is really variable. And I don't do penguin research or sea ice research, but I know that that's a really active area. Of, uh, some some penguins are increasing, some species are increasing, some are decreasing as the optimal sea ice conditions change. But I would love to hear about it, what it was like in 1969. Very good. Okay, and then a question about krill. So if krill is the dominant food source, do you know much about its capacity for dealing with warming oceans? Yeah, I don't know very much about it, but I know that I think the big concern is that krill are really dependent on the sea ice formation. And so if that becomes affected, then krill populations are also going to become affected. And yes, that will have really big cascading effects on larger animals, things like whales and seals and penguins. Very good. All right. And then uh, there's one final question again about oxygen saturation, if you happen to know the level in parts per million. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comprehensive exam, Amy. <laughs> I don't have that right in my fingertips, unfortunately. I, <laughs> that you don't want uh, the partial pressure. Um, I don't know what it is in parts per million. But if you, here, I'll put my email in the chat. And if anybody wants data, I can, can send it to you. Perfect. I have a lot of data on that. Sounds great. Well, I think we'll wrap up our question and answer session at this point. I'd like to give a final thank you to Amy Moran for her wonderful webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and also like to thank everyone in our audience for attending today. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Our next event is going to be held on Wednesday, March 8th at 2 p.m. Hawaiian. And it's going to feature Dr. Elizabeth Gross, who is a faculty member in the Department of Mathematics here in the College of Natural Sciences. Uh, whose work fo focuses on algebraic statistics. So please watch your inboxes for your invitations to that event. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening and aloha everyone.